Evaporation is a very common method used to concentrate a solution by vaporizing the solvent in a suitable vessel known as an evaporator. Typically, aqueous solutions are used whereby the solvent is water. Evaporation is used in several different industrial processes, ranging from the food and beverages sector to the pharmaceutical sector, as well as the chemicals and polymers sector. Typical examples of everyday products that use evaporation are things like fruit juices, such as orange juice, but also milk, syrup, coffee, whey protein, and sodium sulfate, among many others. As mentioned previously, the main concept of evaporation is to vaporize the solvent within a solution in a vessel known as an evaporator. The remaining solution in the evaporator after vaporizing some of the solvent is at a higher concentration than the original solution. This makes sense because if we consider a very simple example of a beaker of water containing salt, if we assume that there are one, two, three, four, five salt particles, each with a mass of one gram, then we can assume that the total mass of salt in the beaker is five grams. If we then say that the total volume of water in the beaker is 10 decimeter cubed, we can work out the salt concentration in the beaker using the formula concentration equals mass over volume. If we plug the numbers in, we get concentration equals mass over volume, which equals 5 grams divided by 10 decimeter cubed, which gives us a salt concentration of 0.5 grams per dm cubed. If we now apply some heat to vaporize some of the water in the beaker, the total volume in the beaker would therefore be less because some of the water will have evaporated. Let's assume that after evaporation, the total volume in the beaker is now 8 dm cubed. Since the mass of the salt in the beaker remains the same, if we now recalculate the salt concentration in the beaker, we now have 8 dm cubed of water as opposed to 10. So the concentration is now going to be 5 divided by 8, which gives us 0 0.63 grams per dm cubed, which is clearly greater than 0 0.5 dm cubed. Therefore, this clearly shows that after evaporating, the concentration does indeed increase. Now that we understand the basic principles behind evaporation, we can now look at how evaporators work in more detail. Here we've got a very simple example showing of an evaporator containing a solution being heated by a heating element. The cold feed solution is pumped into the evaporator and heated. Typically, low pressure steam is used in most industrial applications to heat the solution in the evaporator. This can involve either direct contact of the steam with the solution or indirect contact, for example, using tubular heating surface, coils, jackets, or plates. In this diagram, we've shown steam passing through a metal heating coil, which heats up the coil and then transfers this heat to the solution in the evaporator. So there's no direct contact between the steam and the solution being heated. As the solution in the evaporator is boiled, it causes vapour to be withdrawn, which is passed out of the vessel. The solution that remains after the removal of the water is often referred to as the concentrate, or the concentrated liquor, as it will be at a higher concentration than the original feed solution. As the steam passes through the heating coil to heat up the cold feed solution, it condenses and leaves the evaporator as condensate. There are a number of different factors to consider when designing evaporators. Of course, safety of the operation is arguably one of the most important factors to consider. For example, are there any explosive hazards involved? Are there any toxic vapours produced? If so, where do these vapours go and are they being emitted to the atmosphere? Another extremely important factor to consider is the type of solution that is being evaporated. For example, if the solution contains dissolved solids, the liquor that is produced in the evaporator may become saturated, forming crystals. This can be a big problem because if not cleaned up properly, scale can be formed which can reduce the overall heat transfer coefficient as well as potentially clogging up the evaporator. In addition to this, the concentration and viscosity of the feed solution will also need to be considered and how these parameters will affect the process in any way. The temperature of the evaporator is also another very important factor. This is because different solutions boil at different temperatures. Moreover, some solutions are more sensitive to temperature than others and therefore may degrade at even low temperatures in the evaporator. For these types of solutions, vacuum operation is useful as the reduced pressures result in a lower boiling point. The mode of the evaporation is equally important. For example, are we dealing with a single effective evaporator or a multiple effective evaporator? Is it a forward-fed or backward-fed operation? 
Is there any requirement for sterile operation? For example, in food and pharmaceutical operations, this will be very important. Finally, foaming in the evaporator is another factor to consider. This is because some solutions, typically organic substances, generate foam during vaporization, which can be undesirable as the foam can be entrained in the vapor, leaving the system. There are a number of different modes of operation in an evaporator. The most simple mode of operation is a single effect evaporator. Here the evaporation essentially takes place in one single step using one single evaporator. As a result, the process is relatively simple to do. However, the vapor that is produced is then condensed and is typically discarded, which is quite wasteful. Typically to evaporate one kilogram of water using a single effect evaporator would require anywhere between one to 1.5 kilograms of steam which is not very efficient at all. As a result, single effect evaporators are normally only used when the throughput is low, there is cheap supply of steam available, when the vapor is contaminated such that it can't be reused, or when you're dealing with corrosive feeds where a specially designed evaporator is required, constructed from expensive material. You can also have multiple effect evaporators, which essentially involve using multiple single effect evaporators arranged in series in either a forward or backward fed arrangement. This way of operating is more complicated as there are more effects involved. However, since the vapor produced in the first effect is then passed to the steam chest of the next effect in line, the process is overall a lot more energy efficient and less wasteful. Therefore, the operating costs are much lower despite the higher capital cost of essentially having more evaporators. The more effects you have, the more energy efficient the process becomes, which will therefore reduce your operating costs. However, there will of course come a point where there are too many effects to allow the operational savings to offset the increase in capital costs. There are various types of evaporators available to use, which all use the basic principles of evaporation, but work in slightly different ways. For example, there are natural circulation evaporators, forced circulation evaporators, film type units such as rising film evaporators, falling film evaporators, agitated thin film evaporators, and finally plate type evaporators.